Now, Ryan did a project out at his place. This is not his, but this is another location. This is permanent mulches. So there's a variety of mulches you can use. There's the paper and the plastic mulches, as well as these permanent mulches, serving a variety of purposes. Some of it is to reduce the labor, because like I said, we want to make sure your profitability is high. Uh, but you have to have the soils that you can manage these things with. It would be nice if you had the equipment in order to place them. But the nice thing is about if you use, there's a variety of color of mulches, and some of them will do different things for you. We did a research project here a few years ago with engineering where we used the green mulches, the red mulches, the white, the plastic, and the clear. And they all actually brought different capabilities if you used them properly. The thing we found out with all the black mulches was is black absorbs heat, but it doesn't make the soil any warmer underneath because the black items made it hot. If we use clear, we can get the heat down in the soil, but then we got weed growth underneath of it. If we used red or green mulch, then we found out it allowed the long wave radiation to feed right through it and absorb down into the soil. And this is published. Uh, I should have brought that. Then the whites are really wonderful for reflecting back up into your canopy. They don't do anything about making the soil warmer, but it makes the soil cooler and it reflects. So think about all the different types of mulches and how they might work for you. So we can either keep it warmer, we can keep the weeds down, and then we can also potentially reflect more light up in the canopy. And you may not think that's important, but getting white or the light up into the canopy is critical because that's the essence of where your fruit comes from. We gotta have photosynthesis, we have that conversion, and the sugars have to be stored, and we want it to be in our fruit. Like I said in class, I have students look with the bricks meter, which measures how much sugar is in the fruit. And at lunchtime, I'll run up the greenhouse and get some of my peppers will come up where you guys can nibble on them so you can get a flavor of what a really sugary one is. I'll try to explain bricks to your customers because we use it. <laughs> you don't need to tell them about bricks, do you? Oh. Okay, we just thought it would be a market showing them our sugars were high. They won't understand. <laughs> but it's a tool you can use and you can you can throw the bricks and put a little poster up that says this is the bricks, da 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 compare yours to that. And they're like, really? I, I'm worried about bricks, but <laughs> I don't know. But for you, it's really critical mainly so you know when to target your fruit timing is on it. So, yeah, but educating the audience on the bricks, they won't understand uh, what that's all about. <clears throat> You'll notice uh, this particular mulching. This is out at Gurley, which has not a tree for about 32 miles, I think. And uh, <laughs> so they have problems with their mulches lifting, so they have these, yeah, sandbags to hold the crazy things down there. Uh, this is over in Iowa, because I don't have any in Nebraska to show, no. Uh, but this is the black plastic mulches. This one, as I said, is not necessarily going to warm the soil that much, uh, but it does make the surface warmer. So they're doing early season planting, they're doing the raised beds, so you have to have the soil conditions that you can get these things uh, to lift up like this if you have a bed shape or whatnot. You poke the holes in and put your plants in. You're off in, uh, in creating a warmer environment around the plant for grow. The roof zone isn't necessarily going to be that much warmer. Uh, so just keep that in mind with it, all right? Uh, but it is going to keep our weed problems down and hopefully uh, make our uh, production labor quite a bit less. Now this is out Ryan's. He did a project out there for us, or it was his project. He had a combination of mulches permanent mulches, paper mulches, or biodegradable mulches and plastic mulches. So, Ryan, do you have anything you want to say about that specifically? Your takeaway message on that? No, uh, the biodegradable ones are kind of hard to work with. They were a thinner product. Yeah. So, um, did you try degrading them whatsoever? Yeah, we've killed some in. I don't know if we did with that, but we've killed some in on other stuff, and it's usually in the fence row where I bring that's what I wanted you all to hear, is the biodegradables are all touchy-feely and great, but there is there is a struggle with They're it. They're harder to put down, but they don't disappear. So. Yeah. They don't disappear, harder to put down. So, uh, And you said you had a plastic pull-up, 
Brian, did you say you have a way to pull plastic back up? We have a lifter. We we'll lift pull it up by hand. Oh, okay. All right. So just kind of keep that in mind. So the costs, what were the costs, do you remember, on that project? You see, the permanent mulch is the most expensive. Yeah. Was biodegradable or plastic? But so, uh, <laughs> the biodegradable is probably two or three times what the LDP is. Okay. So, yeah. So like I said, you'll have to, that's why we do these farm tours. So if you want to ask Brian what his thoughts are on it, um, he received funding and we asked him to add, I don't remember what we had. Did we have to add permanent mulch or what did we do? Yeah. We just wanted to compare it, just so you guys could see it. So this was a farm tour of his operation, so you can see. You did see some melons produced earlier, is that true? When you did it, or not really? I don't know. <coughs> okay, all right. I think you had said a couple weeks earlier whenever they used mulches. Keeping in mind, our target is always to be the first one at the farmer's market, right? In order to, uh, to make the most money. Oh, and if you'll notice at Ryan's place, there was severe weather. So, like I said, so keep that in mind. Casey and I, I told them that everywhere we go, we bring weather. So, notice the sun's not here today, right? I don't know what it is about the Stacy and Casey thing, but anyway. All right, so row covers or something else. Um, we were going to fund a project and it fell through for a particular reason, but um, you might want to consider this. There's a lot of it being used. There's these clear plastic ones like this. You'll see a little wire hoop. Once again, it takes the right equipment to, to shape the beds, get those put into place, and as you saw from Gurley, Nebraska, with the sandbags, this stuff will blow away. So um, you'll notice this is actually bedded in. The plants are put in there with drip tape. That plastic is left on whatever period it needs to be, probably three weeks, roughly. Uh, you'll notice it's vented. Um, and then here is something else you can use, which is the, the fabric. Uh, floating row covers, which you are probably familiar with. When you get these books, read about it in here. It also talks about the same problem. Uh, so in this book, it talks about row covers. You'll notice that some of them are pins, some of them are bags, some of them are strapped. I'm always envious of everybody that does not live in Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, because they don't have wind. All of us do. I think it's the Great Plains that we just blow lots of wind. So if you're going to do any of this, remember you have money tied up in it, so make sure that it's not ended up in your fences um, and that's doing what you need to. But remember these because don't cancel them out because they do have a good purpose that we can use. Here you can see a couple types. This is a fabric spun fiber. One of our growers was an organic grower and he was interested in using it two ways. One, to keep insects off. Actually, three ways. Keep insects off. He wanted to keep uh, the sunlight down so it didn't burn his crops. And he was going to put bee pollinators on the inside of it. So there was a, uh, this is a low one. He was going to have a tall cloche or a tall uh, cover. So consider the different things you can do, especially if you're in organic or sustainable type production. Anybody know what that is on the left? White It is. Anybody grow it? I bet there's some restaurants that would love to buy that. When I was young and stupid, I'm old and stupid now, but young and stupid, um, we had an acre of asparagus research on campus. And I was in late 20s back then. And we had blanching cranes. Did I say blanching? Italation, I'm sorry, italation frames. They were nothing more than welded wire uh, remashed but using concrete. And we made these tunnels out of them. And I, I actually shaped it with wood with a vent on each end. And we used the panda plastic, which is black, white plastic. So it was black on the inside, white on the top. And we put these over our asparagus rows. Not a lot of investment, but value-added product, right? However, education is another thing. Because in order to sell these asparagus, you have to make sure that you have a chef that can create some elegant thing with it. So I didn't. I guess I didn't give you the picture of that. This is what asparagus usually looks like. That has been idiolated, we call it. It's stretched. 
The style, the way they do it back east in New York and those areas is they um, have them in these dirt beds. So in other words, you have your crown, asparagus crown, and then they have these high beds and they run the dirt deep during the initial part of the crop and then they have to dig that dirt out in order to finish it out if I remember right. Uh, I asked the professor, it was Dr. Um, Roger Ulinger. I don't know if anybody remembers that name, a long time ago. Uh, it was his work and how they would do it. He said in New York was they just cut with the blade down in the dirt and pull these things out. A lot of work. So the work we did here was to create these artificial uh, frames. So that's just an idea for something for value-added product. We don't see these in uh, uh, Nebraska yet. California, Arizona, New Mexico region. Uh, the viticulture people, the great producers for wine, are using something similar in order to shade their crops. These have pull down side. This one doesn't, but because uh, this is in, New or in Arizona. But when I've gone to growers' conferences, they have these with side wall things, and you can pull this down so you can season extend a particular crop. It's really great for any of these woody crops that we're talking about, the raspberries, um, blackberries, anything that's more of a bigger crop that you need to pull something down. Like I said, they're using it in the grape industry if somebody is doing it for high culture or intensive culture. Okay, so we're back out to Gurley. They wanted to put in some uh, low tunnels, so they wanted to do something called caterpillar tunnels. These would move on the ground, so they had two different types we had to build. One of them, they wanted to build on wood frame, which would be hooked up to a tractor and drug on the trail, a tractor trail, so they could do cool season crops really early. Then they could move this thing, grow more cool season crops under the, the white shade, and then they could start some more material outdoors. So it would kind of go down this 100, I don't know, it was about 125 foot rail, I think. So they could get basically three different crops on their field uh, by doing this. They did this one, which was on a wood frame, and then there was another one they put on a metal frame. So there you can see the caterpillar tunnel. They'd start, the back side opens up a little door, so they could just pull the thing down and go over the crops so they can move down the field. So that was the project that they did. Uh, minimal investment. I don't know what that structure was. About 6,000 maybe? I don't know. Here you can see it. Like I said, in Gurley, Nebraska, the wind is really high. Uh, there's their wood rail system. <clears throat> it's, it's clamped on in a few places and then they just hook it up here to the tractor and they can pull it forward and then they're on new soil. As the crop gets more established, then they just move it down the field on it. It is batten down because there are enough high winds out there. How big was that, Stacy? This one was um, pretty small. It was 16 feet by, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 48 feet. So 16 by 48. And he had two of these. That's what he had. Now, this was a new emerging grower. They, they still had a, a permanent job, and they did this on the side. So we were helping them get a try this project out on there. This is inside of it. Now this was, I don't know, it was horrible. Horrible weather. Always horrible weather. Um, it was cold. <laughs> I don't think I could feel my hands or my feet this day. But underneath of this they had uh, different types of cold crops growing and they were still green. You can kind of see them. We didn't uncover them very much. It would drop to about 20 degrees on the inside, but by using these, uh, they didn't use quite enough. They actually have, and Hummerts will talk to you hopefully later, about the different grades, because they have different densities. Some of them are more of a thermal blanket, and some of them are just light shading. So keep that in mind. Just because this one is maybe two cents a cute, uh, square foot, and this one is eight cents a square foot, you kind of get what you pay for. So it's either light gray or heavy. Uh, so keep that in mind. But they used this. They captured the sun's energy because this thing got in there in the uh, all about the 50s or 60s during the day. So they'd uncover these, let the ground warm up, and then they'd cover back up, and they could keep these crops going in harvest. We also saw one at Plattsmouth that was very similarly done. The only issue we had with one over that direction was the cats inside of the tunnel. Anybody they have a problem with cats in the tunnel? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, they kept it down for rodent control, but I'm not sure that that was quite what we saw as the cat was scratching across the surface. So anyway, we won't go there. All right, um, this is actually from Florida. I wanted to show you, I didn't have a shame structure one. Casey has one from Elm Creek. I couldn't find it, but I just wanted to remind myself these are shade structures. They're used all the time. Uh, this one is nothing more than poles and cables. And you can see, unfortunately, this grower is in Florida, and they have hurricane winds. So uh, I bring storms. Maybe it's me and not you. Uh, they had just had a storm and had ripped some of the cloths up. But you can kind of see uh, it's critical that when you ever build anything, that you make sure it, it can handle me coming or the weather, whichever. All right. <coughs> All right, here's a high tunnel that I built here on campus for a project. This is a pretty nice one. And I'm sure Hummerts probably will offer something like this. They can offer anything from simple to complex. The reason I chose this one is we did it for a, an extension project. Um, it's, it's a complete package. A lot of our people that are in this industry are dabblers your gearheads, you like to tape and baling wire and build things, and you can. But some people have absolutely no skill, they don't know which end of a screwdriver to even use. And that's where this comes into play. So this is a company um, that we have found, I think Hummerts even used to carry Polytex. Do you still have their stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so you can get this product through them, probably. Uh, it's nice because it's what I call pre-engineered. You'll get a set of instructions and you'll put it together. Me and a, and a young lady from the university, a student, built this just for an eye. So it's very easy. It's well thought out, but you do pay for that. Now you can go, you can get inexpensive structures, and you see probably, you probably all have farm tech magazines laying everywhere, and you'll see cheap prices, but be wary of that because you'll either have wide bow spacing, you won't have wind bracing, you won't have... Uh, you won't have any type of roll-ups, you won't have any poly locks, so uh, that's where they get you. So I want you to think about it. But these are really nice. This structure here is one of the least expensive pre-engineered Polytech ones. I have a little bit of difficulties with it because you'll notice the roll-up walls. What you're not seeing is this is a half-round structure. It doesn't have side walls. It was inexpensive, but the problem is when you roll the side walls up, if it rains, the water comes down and drops on all the crops on the inside. So you'll need to try and think about that. I didn't think about that and kept flooding our crops out along the wall all the time. Uh, you'll notice on the inside we had asparagus, so we could force asparagus earlier. What we did was we had a mirror project here, so everything that was planted here was inside so we could extend our um, produce offering that we had. You can use mulches on the inside of your structure. <clears throat> you can use remains. So there you can see, as I showed you a little bit ago, uh, you can provide double layers of protection. The cool thing about this is you'll notice there's not much structure holding these items up. So once you have the plants inside, um, you have a nice protection area. This is one of our growers out there that has uh, a semi-determinate tomato plant growing. So you can start some in high tunnels, and then you can start some outdoors in order to extend the growing season. And I think I have one that's more uh, complex. You'll notice the structure is quite a bit better on this one. It has the straight side walls with the roll up. And if Ryan's listing, he'll realize this is his place at the end of a crop. And he's not proud of the crop. <laughs> I was looking. What? I was looking. I recognize the hay rack. On yeah, the that's his hay rack. So Ryan uses this early. I know this was getting towards the late of inside in the tunnel. But keep that in mind. He can get four, four weeks early harvest, harvest uh, inside the tunnel until he moves into the outside. So he uses it in conjunction. We're not replacing outdoor production. We're just using it as an extension tool or season extension tool. This is down in Hebron. <coughs> Probably the world's worst soil conditions I had ever seen. And these people turned this in, and it basically turned out to be a wonderful uh, little project. So I'll show you the inside here. Once again, it's very similar to one you just saw. This one has drop down walls, which is different than roll up walls. So everybody's used to the crank up and locking it. The problem with that is, is the cool air passes in down low at plant height. 
but the heat is higher up in the structure. So this one was a nice one because it has drop down walls that come down. So if you need early season cooling or you don't want the wall to be open that far and freeze everything on the wall, you can bring it down just a little bit, let the heat out and homogenizes the air down here. Not as cheap as roll up, but it gives you more opportunity to control your environment. So you'll also notice, and if you've ever had that happen, right now my house doesn't have any gutters because I didn't get them up before winter. Every time it rains, there's like so many, there's so much water coming off our roof. I didn't know we had that much water. You know, you're used to gutters and it's kicking the water off and you don't think about it. But now that I have gutters on my house and home, I got all this water everywhere. Same as here, and this grower took advantage of that. This is a tough environment. I don't even know what they call that area down there. It's kind of a high glacier area. Soil is a little bit tough. They did some deep tillage over here, and they have a melon crop here, and they put some uh, sweet corn over here to kind of block it from the winds, because you notice uh, the trees are a little closer. It's about seven miles away here. <laughs> uh, so. You can see we have this really nice protection and they can get some uh, watermelon and some other cucurbits there. This is inside the structure. And Casey, I ripped this from you. So this is Casey's picture. You'll see tomatoes. These are semi-determinate. They're growing them on cattle fencing. I don't know how well that worked. They did a nice job. It looked beautiful. Um, I'm not sure how difficult it was to work with that. I think less is more myself. If, if you could just train them up something simple so you don't have to deal with so much infrastructure. And maybe I'm an idiot. I can't seem to get plants out of stuff. I, you know, I give up and throw the fence out because <laughs> I'll let it rot from here before I put the fence back up. So uh, he may have had a system and I wasn't paying attention about how they were fastening up there. So you'll notice he has a couple different types. He had a uh, semi-determinate crop or uh, intermediate determinate cropping. We grow six to eight foot tall tomatoes. Here he had determinate cropping, planted at the same time, and you can see the s s uh, significant difference in the growth. Here he has a lot of tomatoes on, and they were still putting more growth on with a determinate type. The plant will grow up, put flowers on, and stops growing upward. So he wasn't able to utilize this space as well. But this was the whole bit of this project was to kind of look at it. You'll notice he has wide aisles maybe a bit too wide. However, when I did our high tunnel out here on campus, I had it too narrow, and I was like grossed out every time I went in there because I finally gave up spraying or doing any type of pest control. It was just, it was just a nightmare. It was a tunnel of just plants. And so you have to kind of balance that. What is a good working distance? So I don't remember. I think he put these on six foot on center on the inside. A lot of them are putting them about four or five feet, so that kind of give you an idea. Over on the right, you'll see he had some cucumbers and some beans, and I think I have some pictures. Yep. Yeah. Oh, there's the cucumbers going up the fence. And I wanted to give you an idea how big this tunnel is, so you can see the people walking in there. So this is a big house. I think this was a 30, uh, must have been 32, 34 feet wide. So it was a large house but it offered a big area protection. Their environment, they wanted a little bit early season warm up, but they wanted a lot of environmental protection. So a lot of rain and wind exposure that they need control. There was a lesson to be learned on this. And that's why we brought Hummerks in. And there's other people other than Hummerks. There's Stuppies, Polytex, name brand companies. Work with a name brand company. This one came from one of those mom and pop operations. Uh, the writing on the wall was when they got the instruction manual, it was in handwriting. It, it, it didn't work out real well. It was, it was a really tough construction. It looks nice, <laughs> it's really durable, but there was a lot of bizarre issues that showed up on this. So basically, if you can save a few hundred bucks, it may not be worth it, because that's what happened here. It ended up costing probably a lot more because there was missing components. The shade, or the, 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 the plastics were cut wrong, so they came in like six feet too short. And you can't stretch plastic, you can make it smaller, but you can't make it longer. So there was just a lot of really bizarre issues that occurred on this. So that was the learning opportunity on there. 
This is Brunswick, uh, Nebraska, which is up north, northwest of Norfolk. Has anybody ever really been up there for very much time? The environment is definitely different than here, isn't it? You're laughing. It's different. It's a climate zone different than here. I mean, it's serious. You cross Highway 20 and you're in the North Pole. <laughs> and they have tornadoes there. Yeah. Casey and I saw one. He saw, there was a guy, what was he, 70 years old, sitting at the dinner table? And I went outside because I thought, I'm from Kansas. We have tornadoes every half, week and a half, two weeks. <laughs> And I saw debris coming down from the sky, so I didn't say anything in case he was talking to these guys. And I walk out there, and all this debris coming. Yep, there it is. There's the tornado over there. So I go inside. Hey, has anybody ever seen a tornado? <laughs> <laughs> and some people go hide, and the other people would jump up and go out to go look at the tornado. Because that's what you do when you're from Nebraska and Kansas, right? You go see the tornado, right? <laughs> Anywhere else in the world, you go seek cover. But no. So, anyway. So this is uh, Brunswick. Um, the tornado had already passed that day. You can see it's off to the back. And I'm serious, this, it happened about an hour before this. Um, this is the one that hit Wayne. Mm -hmm. If that tells you what this was that day. That one started at my house. Okay. Right, a little black cloud right above us. Yeah, it wasn't very big. No, it just, by. Thing, just yep. made a lot of noise. Yep. A little rain came out of it, sun all around it. Yep. We was on the way to Fremont to, to a football game, and we got 20 minutes down the road, and, and her dad calls and said the tornado hit lane. And I was like, oh. So if Casey and I ask you if we can do a farm tour at your place, however, we've not dead yet. And the structures always turn out nice. This one here is at um, Brunswick, and it was successful enough they built another one even beyond the project that we were doing. This is blackberry production. And why don't I show you on the inside? These people are interesting because they have aronia berries, which you maybe can see some of the back. They must have had about five acres of aronia berries. And then they had uh, rhubarb. And uh, they had some other products. This is the one that they had the deer problems at. So they really elegantly designed their whole operation into a big square. And they had it sectioned into four quarters with fencing. It also allowed them to use goats, goats, sheep, a particular type of sheep that could go through and do the weeding for them too. So they could do this uh, fertilizing. It was kind of an inter interesting design. Now this was the first year here, and I want you to bear with me. This is what it's going to look like. This is from another university, but I just want to show you the problem they were having in Brunswick and the reason we funded their project was it was a crapshoot. We were talking about the environment. That's why I'm rattling about the environment is about half the time the raspberries would freeze before they could get into the market. And the only way they could protect them was to use irrigation. So when we went up there, one picture I have is ice, probably an inch thick on everything. So they would turn the irrigation on to keep things from freezing, and then they'd wait till thawed for the day, and then they'd go harvest their fruit. And it was like, this is nonsense. So this particular project, we came up with a double strategy, triple strategy. One, field raspberries. Actually, it's four. You have field raspberries that are cut down in the spring. They won't fruit till fall. You have field raspberries that you thin, but don't cut all down, and you harvest earlier in the season. High tunnels the same way. Some of it's cut back, some of it's not. So they had four opportunities to do their harvest. So the high tunnel one would be early from the non-cutback material, then the outdoor non-cutback material, then the high tunnel cutback material, uh, I'm getting it backwards. Mm -hmm. Anyway, long story short, you can see what they did. And raspberries are what? 385, 4 something? A quart? Crazy hot. And, and so that was the struggle they had, and this is the way they had tackled it. And it was successful enough that, like I said, they had this other one. Which gets to the structure. They spent an absorbent amount on the structure. I mean, it must have been $12,000. So 
something like that. It's an extremely high, high tunnel. So um, I think the peak on this one was 13 feet, which was just amazingly high. And it had seven foot side walls. And you can see it had extra supports. And look at the structure on the top. It's basically a beam structure. This thing's not going anywhere. So they, they will invite Casey and I back because it will withstand weather. Uh, this is a tunnel that can be a high tunnel but was converted to a greenhouse. Um, at issue is the shape or profile of this. And I, my personal greenhouse at home was very, very similar and I had the same problems with it. Is this hip over here causes some issues. And then this one, mine had a gentle grade on the very top. But on this one, it had this sharp peak on the top, which causes uh, holes to develop in the plastic because of the, the uh, abrasion and all that. <coughs> and I don't know what the simple fix is on this. It just has a lot to do with the wind. Um, you may have to add more wood. I mean, this one, we put the wood here. We probably needed to put something on the very peak on the top. But we had abrasion on here, so that gets into some other issues that I won't talk about today. If you ever get to hear me talk on greenhouses, we'll talk about glazing, glazing products, and the ways to secure it on there and keep it from having too much abrasion. How often do you have to change the plastic on that? Every year on that one. Every year. Every year on this one. <laughs> Brian knows. So now in the wintertime, you got to roll the plastic up and put it away so it doesn't... No, this one was supposed to be covered all the time. Just to give you an idea, the poly house is outside of campus right out here five years. But you need to inflate it, and you got to secure. Uh, it needs to be fastened securely, clear around. It's like a Ziploc bag. It's got to be continuously secured. And the inflation is to keep it going up so that the snow don't push it down. Correct. And I think it's 0.5 inches of water column pressure. I call it the thump test. Right, Tim? <laughs> I took him in greenhouse management out there. I was like, this is what it should be like. Boom, boom, boom. But not. Thump, thump, thump. Because if it's that, it's too tight and it's stretching the plastic. I know it's bizarre. If it's too soft, it absorbs everything. And that's bad. The plastics have become amazing. When I was in college, plastic was only two-year plastic. Then we thought three-year was fascinating. Then we got to four-year. Now we're up to five- and six-year plastics. They will only last that long, though, is if you have it securely fastened and it doesn't have any sort of... A, uh, jumping or jiggling or abrasion going back and forth. So uh, when they give you that warranty saying that, you have to make sure that it's going to be able to... Why does that picture keep showing up? I'm getting worn out seeing you. Okay. <laughs> Litchfield, Nebraska. Where's that? Central Nebraska. They have a food drought out there. They got grant funding to put this in. This is in Litchfield, 36 feet wide, 100 feet long. It's food drought, so we've got safe, fresh foods. If you've ever been up to Brunswick and went to the local grocer, which might be in Nybrera, I'm from down by Firth, 30 miles south of Lincoln. You go to Hickman to the grocery store, and their produce is like, it's like, where's the stuff been? So think about the poor people from about Seward West of Nebraska, and they don't have good food. So that's why they go to the farmer's markets. Litchfield, same problem. This is an uh, opportunity to enhance the income in the town, jobs for uh, people that have kids that go to school, so young women can go work in there. They use it for education, so the school system is involved. Uh, it was just a really unique situation where the community Trotter Fertilizer Company is the one that secured the grant. If you've ever heard of them, Trotter Farms. Uh, this concrete I'm standing on is now a retail spot. So I've helped them get established. They do bag culture, hydroponics, bench container production. They do seasonal ornamentals and they sell all this stuff in here. But we have to be careful because we can glut the market out there. But people, the nearest place to go is Carney, Nebraska, which is about 45 minutes away. Uh, this is a student of mine from about uh, eight years ago. Here's some bag culture. Unfortunately, I have it on benches, but we put two peppers in a three-gallon bag. We can mix our own potting mix. 22 pounds of peppers on one plant. Jeez. 
uh, these were a, this is green bell. Here's a sweet banana that we have here. I don't like hot peppers. <clears throat> Look at those plants. See how loaded they are? Now this is getting into greenhouse. So we've stepped up a little bit. We've gone from high tunnel or cold frame high tunnel. And now we're up to a greenhouse type situation. But if you think about peppers, what are they selling for at the grocery store right now? What? Two dollars a fruit each. So think of how many dollars is on one of these plants. So we have to think about, can we pencil it out? Can we make it work? And so that's our challenge. Now these are spread out. Um, it was just something I was doing. This is actually rainbow I see. So I have rainbow right here. So I had a variety of different plants in here. I do this as just prototype stuff to see, can it work? Do you have to have bees? Do we have to pollinate? No, we didn't have to do any of that. Uh, but you do need to have warm temperatures if you're going to do peppers. Do you have a cage holding that up? No, bamboo canes. So I just use bamboo. I might, if anybody wants to later today, I'll take you up to the teaching greenhouse. It's teaching, keep in mind, teaching. So I have some hydroponic stuff up there. If anybody wants to look at it, you're welcome to see it. This is uh, back in Ohio. I want to show you this. It's a very small operation. So we're not talking big money investment like the Trotter Farms one. This structure here, quite a bit less expensive. You see it's just polyethylene coated. A little shack here, a little shed out here. Let's go inside and take a look at what they've got going on in there. Eggplant in bag culture. So here you see the bags. Irrigation system in there. Look at all the eggplant that they have. So this is one group. So this is a mixed planting. Here you can see tomatoes. And this is, uh, mine doesn't look quite like this right now, but you can see the, the, the bu buckets, Dutch buckets, or you could just use regular old five gallon pickle buckets if you can still get them. Or your Homer, what do they call them, Homer buckets? Buck 50 each at, at uh, Home Depot. <clears throat> Perlite is in them, and then you're just giving them all nutrition. You guys are all smart horticulturists. You know how to provide nutrition to these plants. These are indeterminate greenhouse varieties. That's the killer. The seeds are very expensive. A couple bucks a seed. Somewhere between a dollar, two dollars per seed. Uh, but when you see how many pounds you can get off of these, we're talking in the 60 pounds per plant range, as opposed to the 20 some pounds in the field. These are peppers. Now I have some of these in the greenhouse and mine don't look like this. I planted them in September and they're still only this tall. But I'm getting peppers on them. They're just not growing quite like this. Now I have the same variety. But this is an indeterminate green pepper, sweet pepper. So you can grow them similar. Oh, no they're not. You can see they're orange up on the very top up there. Must not be, I don't have the same variety. <clears throat> Okay, this is NFT system, which is nutrient, uh, NFT, nutrient film technology. I have one of these running up in the teaching greenhouse right now. We have lettuce in it. Our students found out, or they will find out, because we're supposed to have salads in a couple more weeks. Four more weeks. We just moved them. It takes six weeks from the time you sow them until you harvest. It's pretty cool, actually. A uh, little bit of investment. This is a high-end tray. I'll show you mine in a little bit. Does anybody know what these are? Nasty tertiums. Why do I have them? People like to eat them. Who said that? I did. I always grow them. Okay. I know Bloom, Bloom Organics. Is it Bloom's Organics or Bloom <coughs> Bloom's? Bloom's Organics. Do you do this, Jerry? Uh, just for the restaurant. There's a variety of flowers that we could be offered. So squash blooms, um, nasturtiums. Uh, I know years ago I was at the Cornhusker Hotel for a banquet, and, was, and when they found it was horticulture that was going to be there, they did that for us specifically. So there are edible blooms that we could put in there. Casey, I'll wrap it up here. This is, uh, are they ready up here? Whenever you're there, okay. you're in. Let me finish it up here. Uh, this is South City, City at Cardinal Farms. Uh, affordable structure is an investment, but it's not a high-end glass structure. It's all polyethylene covered. This is what it looks like on the inside. Dutch buckets. There you can see tomatoes on indeterminate. Their market timing is bizarre, though. 
and I don't mean to offend anybody if you're from Cardinal Farms, for some reason they start their plants in February and harvest in May, June, July, August, September, October. What's the problem with that? We can do high tunnels and we can do field, right? So typically when I do mine, we start in August and go August, September, October, November, December, and we'll wrap it up in May or June. So um, they do it. So uh, I don't know how they're hitting the market, uh, but if you want to work for like school systems and sell them tomatoes, that's a great niche to get into is providing food, but you got to have it from August through the winter until that May period, so think about it. Uh, this is in, in Cleveland, and I've done these same, these are cucumbers. Not just any cucumber. They're seedless. Um, oh, I'm a brain lapse. They're European cucumbers. So they're European seedless, thin-skinned cucumbers. These are amazing. No, they're this oh, oh, they're, they're certain. But they're usually wrapped in plastic. So if you ever go to a store and see a cucumber in plastic, you thought, why? And it has to do with them being thin skin. They won't hold moisture real well. Uh, so this was like a five acre cucumber operation. I'll tell you what, we grew 12 cucumber plants in our greenhouse and I thought I was going to die of cucumbers. So we <laughs> only have about six plants now and that'll be enough to feed most of the East Campus. Uh, they're amazing plants. There's a, a few varieties out there. Uh, I think we have cum laude think is what we have. Seeds are expensive. You can get them through Hydro Farms over in, in Colorado. You know, when you order your hemp seed, you can also order uh, cucumber seed. They have it. <laughs> I can get mine from the fence. There you go. <laughs> <laughs>